Yeah, yeah, you use that. Go ahead and use that, okay? Okay, we're going to begin. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you out today. Out and about in this first Sunday of 2021. I don't know if any of you ever thought we would make it this far in this world. Um, I remember when I was a kid growing up that science fiction movies were about uh, beyond 2000, you know, and so I guess we're living in the time of science fiction, maybe. It seems like it sometimes. Uh, but uh, it is so good to, to be here, and we are going to begin our morning service with a wonderful song. It'll be up here on the screen with a DVD called God Will Make a Way.
Let's pray this morning. Uh, Lord, we just come to you, and we're just, uh, we're just thankful for being able to get up and come to church this morning and worship you, Lord. We just pray that uh, as we start off a new year, Lord, that you just uh, handle this pandemic, that you just get us on the uh, track to going back to normal and being able to live our lives without restriction and, and without fear, Lord. And just uh, be with those that are out there today in our community and in our congregation that are sick, uh, that do have COVID, Lord. We just lift them up to you this morning and just pray that you just uh, heal them and get them back to the safe and sound. And just be with us today as uh, as we go through this worship service, Lord. Just put your message on our heart and just uh, let it uh, have an impact on what we do this week and the weeks to come. And just uh, be with us as we uh, get going this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, um, if you look back uh, on your bulletin right there, we do get started back with Awana this week. Uh, that starts back this Wednesday, so we're looking forward to that. 5.30 for the Children's Choir, and then we'll kick off with our one stuff uh, afterwards. We're still looking for volunteers, uh, a couple that will uh, be able to listen to verses and do things like that for some of our classes. So if you're interested in that, please let uh, Trudy and George know that so they can uh, include you in, in the plans for a one. Uh, also, we have community service hours that are available if you have a youth that needs community service hours. Uh, Melinda can help you out with that. She's got some things that can be done to get those community hours uh, and to help out with that. So just let her know that. She'll get you on the track uh, to, to being involved with that. Uh, also, our Jolly Jays are not meeting this month. Uh, they are planning on meeting uh, for February. So Ms. Uh, Laverne uh, will contact uh, the, uh, the members of Jolly Jays and let y'all know what's going on with that. Uh, we do have business meeting that's scheduled for next week, right after our, our service. Uh, and our deacons meeting will be next uh, week, as of right now, at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, next Sunday. So, got a lot to look forward to. It's a, it's a new year starting. Uh, and let's focus on the positive and, and try not to dwell on the negative this year. Thank you. Thank you, Jory. A couple other things, too. I just want to go over a couple things and recap just a moment for you all about what we've, what's happened this past Christmas season. You know, it seems, boy, Christmas, at first, the year seemed like it was drugging, then all of a sudden, it was like, it's gone. Now we're in 2021. Isn't that amazing? Well, just a couple of things. During the Christmas time, we had, we did have some uh, activities here. There was a group of young people, all the elementary age kids, about seven of them, uh, Amy and I, we took them down for Christmas shopping before Christmas uh, took place, and they bought all sorts of goodies down in Pensacola. We did leave. I'll let me just tell you what, what was still intact. They were, everybody had um, all their digits on their fingers. No, nobody lost a finger. Nobody got into arguments. Uh, Pensacola is still standing, and we had a great time down there. We spent time at the mall. We had Chick-fil-A, and we were blessed by uh, Kona Ice gave us nine free sandwiches, uh, coupons for nine free sandwiches at Chick-fil-A. So we had a great time there. The kids enjoyed themselves, and um, we it was like to, when my kids were little, we'd go to do the Christmas shopping. They all just had a great, great time, and it was so wonderful. And then also, too, we had a, uh, we had a pastor's fishing trip uh, not, not too many weeks ago, and that went very well, and we caught a number of fish. Uh, that was over at the horse stables, and thank you, Tammy, and, with, and thank Mike for that. That was a great time before it turned too cold. Uh, also, too, we had a Christmas Eve service. We had about 41 people show up for that here at the church. And we had a nice time together, and, and, and it was a great time of honoring the, the Lord. Also, too, if you get a chance, we have someone who has a brand new degree in our church. He has a Ph.D. Now, currently, I had also a Ph.D., and this, this past Saturday, this young man received his Ph.D. If you go outside, there are six of the broken pipes on the fence have been dug and they've been replaced and they've been cemented in. And so you have two now, two people with PhDs, postal digger, the degrees. 
So, and that is Bill. So you can thank Bill and congratulate him for his new degree outside. And we got that going, and that's almost ready. We're letting it set up a little bit more until we get it all set, and it'll be fixed in that. Um, with the, and uh, let me also encourage you, too. We do have a, a couple options for your tithing th this year. We have, of course, when you come to, to the service, you can uh, give your, your, your tithing envelope in the offering plate, or if you'd like to mail it in, or what, anything like that is fine. But we also have online giving, and that can be done through our, our website, and it is very easy to do. It will do it both from a credit card as well as from your checking account. You can set that up. And um, I know I have used it a couple times. Has anyone else used it? It's pretty easy. It should be, and I think they even give you a little video to tell you how to do it. It's, it's very easy to do, and I know we live in the electronic age, so if that's something that you would like to do, that is, that is available here. And uh, we just want to encourage you, this coming year, I'm looking forward to some great open doors by, by the Lord. And I just want to encourage you, for the next few weeks, we're going to have messages giving us encouragement on how to start this year off in the best of manners so that we can go through the open doors that God gives us and that we can truly serve the Lord with great gladness. With that said, let us turn to our hymnals to 586. We have a story to tell to the nations. Verses 1 and 4. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We must say, to show to the nations who the path of sorrow had trod, that all of the world's great peoples may come to the truth of God, may come to the truth of God, for the darkness shall turn to God, and the God into noonday bright, and Christ's great And hymn number 555, A Child of the King, and we truly are, if we know Christ the Savior, a child of the King. My Father is rich in houses and lands, he holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full, he is rich as untold. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name soon found, an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the king. A child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. And then hymn number 16 in our word in, in our hymnals, O oh, Worship the King, verses 1 and 4. Shield and defender, the ancient of days. 
And then one more of him this morning. He is able to deliver thee. Verses 1 and 3. Tis the grandest thing through the ages sung. Tis the grandest thing for the mortal tongue. Tis the grandest thing that the world bear sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though I sin and oppress, though to him for us, our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest thing that the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though my sin oppress, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. And we're going to have one more song that you are welcome to sing along with. And it is entitled, He Knows My Name. You know, all of these hymns that we've been talking about is referring to God and our dependence on Him and the message about God that we are to share. But there's something also that I have learned and throughout the course of my life, and I by no means have learned everything, but it is that God does know my name and He does care about us. And even when we might think, well, we're just a blip on the whole swath of life, but we are still important in the sight of God. And whatever we go through in this life, he knows my name. I have a name. He formed my heart before even time began. My life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls, and he hears me when I call. I have a father. I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. He knows my name. Yeah. 
hears me when I call. He knows your name. He knows your every thought. He sees all those tears that fall and he'll hear you when you call he knows my name at this time the children can go to children's church and for the rest of us, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, please let us turn to Joshua chapter 1. Today I'll be using a different version than I normally do. It'll be on the, on the screen. It'll be the Holman Christian Standard Bible this morning. And we're going to be looking at one of my favorite passages in the entire Word of God. And it is one that is very important, I truly believe, for all of us as Christians. We're going to be looking at chapter 1 of Joshua, verses 5 through 9. And the title of the message is, Let Us Start Right. This is the very first Sunday of 2021. We will never have this day ever again. When this day is finished, and it clicks from 11.59 to 12 o'clock, we will never come back to January 3rd, 2021. We have the whole remainder of this year left. <coughs> and what are we going to do with it? As a Christian, we not only have the common things that all human beings go through. Many of us are work. Some of us are retired from the, from the job force. But we go, we buy groceries, we buy things, we, we have to maintain our cars. We have to do many, many things in this world like everybody else. We go to the doctors. I'm sure none of you have ever gone to a doctor before, have you? Okay, I, I hope you're smiling underneath those masks. Uh, we all go to, to the doctors, and we get shots, so we get all sorts of things for, from the doctor's pills, and, and I remember as a young boy growing up that pink medicine, how many of you remember, what was it, um, is it was amoxicillin? Well, whatever it was, it was a, a penicillin. The pink, the pink stuff was, see, you're, you're too young. You didn't have this. Okay, but I will tell you this. I remember that pink, it was either that or a shot. And you know what? I hated shots so much I took the pink. And that was not a fun thing. I remember those things. We've all, we all go through those. This is what human beings do. This is what we do in the life that God has given us. But we also, as a Christian, we have a higher calling to just those things. And not to take away from those things. It's enjoyable to do the various things in life. We go to school. We graduate from school. We go to work. We graduate, we, we graduate every weekend from work. And we, get, we get to relax a bit sometimes. We, we, get to, we, we go for enjoyment. We might go fishing. We might go hunting. We might do various things. We might go roller skating. Whatever we do, we have enjoyment too. But there's still a higher calling than all of that. And that is serving the Lord Jesus Christ in this world that he's placed us in. Each and every one of us here, we have contacts that others do not have. You will meet people and you will have influences over people that will listen to you that I do not have. You can call me as a pastor and say, I have a neighbor who really needs to, to know Christ. Will you come and share with them? I can do that. But who makes the initial contact? It's you, probably. So we all have this, these works to do for God. And so did Joshua. Joshua, you have to understand something about Joshua. He was a very capable person. He was second in charge underneath Moses for so many years. He was one of the two people who were older, he would be the, one of the oldest people in all of Israel at this time. Remember what happened. 
Everybody leaves Egypt. They go into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, the people of Israel misbehave before the Lord. And what does God say? Okay, you are going to be traveling throughout the wilderness for 40 years. It was Joshua and Caleb, when they came back from this, uh, from the kind of the uh, viewing of, of, of ancient Israel, the, the, the land of Israel, they came back as spies. And only two people said, we can do this. We can take this country. Doesn't matter how big the people are, God's in control. But look, it is a land of milk and honey. It is a wonderful land. And it is, it is the land that God has given us. And two out of 12 said, let's do it. 10 said no. And, and the decision was made, no. And God said, you will then travel around this wilderness. And then as the sinfulness of Israel started to come out more and more, and if you follow through the book of Exodus, you will see Moses had a tough job, a real tough job. I still remember, I've used this story be before, but I remember traveling across the Negev, going from so the southern tip of Israel down into Egypt. Now remember, we were in three buses. They had air conditioning. It was the winter time. It was still warm. We had, we had box meals. They had, I mean, this is about as good as you're going to get on a bus in the middle of the desert. And they had a meat. I thought it was bologna. I hope it was bologna. Uh, and, and they had soft drinks, and they had a dessert in there and all of this other stuff. And it was not a nice box meal. And we were protected, and it was a beautiful setting of the desert. And I still remember, I don't eat bologna. I don't like this. This isn't quite cold enough. I don't think... You're on a trip to Israel and Egypt. You pay a lot of money. You are in a nice bus with friends, and you're still complaining. I understand what Moses went through. They didn't quite have a box lunch. I, I bet you the Jewish people of that ancient day would have said, Wow, what an amazing meat, this bologna. This is the best ever. Could you imagine that? And I will tell you, after eating kosher in Israel for over a week, it was nice to have a little bit of bologna. It really was. Because you can only take so much kosher sometimes if you're not that familiar with that kind of cultural food. But here we have, Joshua's now is going to go from second person in charge to the head person. You might say, well, he's a leader. This should have been easy for him. Now think about this, though. Have you ever been second in charge of something? I have been second in charge in, in, in various settings. When I worked at the, at the Bible College and Seminary, I was the academic dean. Generally, the academic dean is the right hand to the president because they're the ones who are going to deal with the classes and with the teachers and how, how the students are trained. And usually they're the ones that are doing all the educational work, and the president is the head person, and they're the ones that are going, and they're more the fundraiser for schools. But it is a big difference to be the academic dean and the president because the board of directors of a school setting do not go to the academic dean unless the president is very upset with them. They go to the president. In the case of Joshua, everybody went to Moses. In fact, remember, Moses' father-in-law said, you need to divide out all of your responsibilities. You're wearing yourself out. And he did that. And they set up all the hierarchy of all of the tribes. But now Joshua was going to be the first person under God. He was the one that people were going to come to, that were going to complain about the baloney and about this and about that. That's who was, going, who, who was going to receive all this. And God gives him a pep talk. And this is the most wonderful pep talk that you could ever get. I know we have a couple coaches here. And coaching... Sometimes you need to give your teams pep talks, am I right? Sometimes you wish they listened to your pep talks, am I right? Amen. Sometimes, amen, you got an amen on that one. But pep talks are great, even for us. Have you ever been de depressed and gone, you knew to the person to go to because they will always say nice things about you and they will kind of, you know, make you happier? You know, it's, it's not escaping reality, but it's nice to have somebody make a nice comment. You know, if you're down and depressed, it's not always nice to have somebody step on you more. 
Well, in this case, God gave the perfect pep talk to Joshua. And he, when he would listen to this, he was successful. And it starts in verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave nor forsake you. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, as we uh, look at this passage to, this morning, may it be an encouragement to us. May it bring us to a better understanding on how we should address this world and how we should carry forward to honor and glorify you in all that we do. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So verse 5, we see here that God will not forsake Joshua. Now, what's interesting here is Joshua, as Bible scholars have looked at the Bible, they have said that he is a type of Christ, and I think in, in, in a couple different ways. But we start first with his name. His name is Yahshua. Now, if you know anything about Hebrew, and I know we have a couple Hebrew scholars here, that the Hebrew language is missing something that the English language has. Vowels. There are no vowels in the Hebrew language. It's all consonantal. Which means that as you learn the Hebrew language starting as a little child and growing up, you start memorizing words. Now, we can do this even in English to a point. If you are given consonants and you see the pattern, you can many times make out what the words are. Have you ever watched, what is that game show, that uh, Wheel of Fortune? You ever watch Wheel of Fortune? How uh, some people are very good about guessing what, to, what the words are by just a couple letters here and there? Because we know the language. Well, Joshua, he has the same exact lettering as the name Yeshua, which is the Hebrew form of Jesus. That's one thing. Now, there were probably many Joshuas. That probably was a very common name. But in this case, he would lead the Jewish nation. And he was like a shadow of who Christ would be. And Joshua was one who did take God serious. Now, he didn't do it always right. The Jewish people didn't do all that they were supposed to do in conquering the land of what we call Canaan. But Joshua was a good leader. And God's initial promise in verse 5 is, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you. I will be your defense. There will be no one who will stand against you. Now you might say, well, what does that have to do with me? I live in the 21st century. I'm not Joshua. I, have the, I don't feel like I'm some great leader. I have a little job over here. I have a job over here. Maybe I am a leader. And sometimes I wonder, how do I incorporate in my lifestyle and my life that God has given me this, this ideal that Joshua was told to follow? Well, first and foremost, let me encourage you, something that Joshua did not have, we have it as a Christian. That is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So God is with us continually. Now, yes, Joshua was told God would always be there with him, but he was not indwelled with the Holy Spirit, only for certain jobs, and then the Holy Spirit would leave him because this was before the time of salvation from sin, and God doesn't share. If you have sin in your life, you're an unbeliever. God does not indwell you with the Holy Spirit. And in this case, only for certain jobs, the Holy Spirit would come upon a person, they would do the work, then he would leave. It isn't until the time of Christ on the um, suffering and death on the cross and his resurrection and the church begins, now we have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit that doesn't leave. He stays with us. On the, uh, on the one side, when we live our lives as a Christian, we have that companionship of the Holy Spirit with us continually. And he's there with us. And there are times, I think, sometimes we might even feel his presence. See, the Bible doesn't say you're going to always feel his presence. If somebody says, if you're not feeling it, you don't have him, that's not true. It, it says in the Bible that this is on God's side. He does protect us. But I will tell you on the other side of that coin, if you make some bad choices, guess what? You will. You, you will understand and it will be made manifest to you that you're not doing it right. I think one of the most miserable people on this earth is the Christian that is living in sin.
because not only are they living in sin, but the Holy Spirit within them, you're dragging him through the sin. And it, it, it's manifested in your mind and in your heart. But this promise given to Joshua, the beginning of it is, I'm not going to forsake you, Joshua. And I think God tells us too, and we see other verses in the, in, in the New Testament that basically says that God's with us. Who can stand against us? He wants us to do well. That's his desire. He wants you to have joy in your heart. Doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. It wasn't all easy for Joshua, I can guarantee you. The first battle that probably crumpled Joshua was the battle of Ai. Remember Jericho? They marched around Jericho multiple times and the walls came tumbling down. God did all this. And God said, take nothing from that city. And what happened? Achan stole the garment and some gold, buried it in his tent. Nobody knew. But what happened? The very next town, and in fact, Ai and Bethel, if you look at the map, how they're situated, some say Bethel probably was the city the men came from. We don't know for sure, but we're talking about small. We're not talking about a major city like Jericho. And when the, the Jewish soldiers went in, they were massacred at Ai. And it came to, to Joshua's mind and others, something is wrong. And they started to search out God. Why? And it came down to it that Achan had misbehaved. One sin, a garment and some gold. What would that matter to God? Is it not what it is? It what it, it's what it meant. <coughs> God said, that's mine. I get the first fruits. I'm going to give you all of the rest. And when one person disobeyed, it caused great harm. Hardship. And I can guarantee you, as a leader, that probably devastated Joshua. He needed to be reminded that God was with him. Even if there's a problem that comes up in one's life, God, God was with him. And for us today, God's with us. You might be struggling. I might be struggling with things. But you know, God doesn't abandon us. What a great, great, hopeful blessing. Let's continue. Verse, verse 6. Verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. So we start, it starts out first with God saying, be strong and courageous. These are two great statements for Joshua because he needed both. And in fact, three times during this passage that we're going to cover today, God says, be strong and be courageous. Now, I will tell you this. In the Bible, every word is important. In fact, God says it's the jot and tittle, so the, the little marks are even inspired. But when God says something once, you better listen. If he says it twice, you really better listen. If he says it three times, if you don't listen, shame on you. Joshua was told to be strong and courageous. You know, as a Christian today, we also need to be strong and courageous in this world. As the, as the time grows closer to the second coming of Christ, the Bible tells us the world is going to grow farther and farther and farther away from God. Now, I've had the, uh, had the great opportunity in the recent uh, year and a half to be involved with this group in training pastors in Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is a very different country from our country. Believers there go to church and worship together with great fear. Pastors, just average Christians who attend church, are being killed, are being taken away, put in jail, are being tried for blasphemy laws that are because they, they stand, they say Christianity stands against Islam. And the, the end result of a blasphemy law, if you lose in a court case, you lose your life. Young girls are being taken away from families. Children are being, are, are being used as pawns to try to destroy parents who turn to Christ. Lands are being taken. Houses are being taken. Persecution is very high. And that's not the worst of the Islamic countries. If you live in North Korea, 
And if you are North Korean, there's a good chance you probably will never hear the gospel. Because many times when people hear the gospel, they are put to death. Terrible ways. Now, if you're from a, another country and you go up there, you can read the Bible all you want. But North Koreans, no. And there's other countries, the, in the Sudan and many, many other countries. Fellow Christians, let me just encourage you, and this is what even Franklin Graham has, has indicated. And I, I believe that this is true. As the world grows farther away from God, even in countries where we have great freedoms to worship God, those freedoms might be in jeopardy. We don't know. So as we come into 2021, do we come in with intrepidation? Do we come in to, to this year with fear? Do we wonder what's going on? Well, you can wonder and you can have concerns, but I will tell you this. Do not have fear. Be brave. Be courageous. Be strong. Fellow Christians, we have God on our side. Just as Joshua in that day had God on their side. When they came back into the land of Canaan from leaving hundreds of years earlier, being brought through the wilderness, Joshua brings them into Canaan. Do you know what the Canaanites had as far as their military that Israel didn't? They had chariots. They had great weaponry that Israel did not always have. But God was on the side of Israel. It didn't matter what they had. God was still in control. And when God tells Joshua, be careful, be strong, be courageous, because God always keeps his promises. And that's for us today, too. You might be wondering, what's going to happen in this world? What is this politically, socially, uh, medically? What's going to happen in this world? We might have concerns, and I think we all probably do to a point. But let me encourage you, don't be, don't be af afraid. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about fear and, and worry and giving that to God. We need to give it to God. You know, I, I will tell you this, and even before coming to, to this part of the country, I've been involved with people that, that were farmers that many times raised cattle. And I will tell you, when you're dealing with nature, whether it be in farming or you're taking care of animals or things like that, there's a lot of ifs. You know, you can have the half a million dollar tractor with the GPS and plant your rows straight and everything else. You can plant your seeds at the right depths. You can keep cattle and give them every inoculation they're supposed to get, all the right feed. You can do all of these things. But there's still... And if there, will the rains come? Will this happen? Will that happen? Well, that's where great faith is given to God. And I will tell you, I've seen that. Great faith given to God. And you know what? God, I believe, does honor that faith. I truly believe that. Yes, we can go through struggles. Even in, even in what we would call the workplace that we feel is safe. Even in those times we can have great issues but we need to go into this into this year like joshua went in the year that he took the children of israel into israel we need to today in 2021 step forward with great strength and courage to know that god is in control that is so so important and in this world we live to today there are many who are wondering out there one of the odd things, in my opinion, that's happening is there are Christian artists, singing artists, who are coming out and saying, I've lost my faith. Well, stop. First thing is, I don't believe you can lose your faith. You, you, might, you might have doubts, but I believe once you're a born-again Christian, you're, you're going to be remaining a born-again Christian. I believe Jesus holds on to you. You're sealed to God through the Holy Spirit's work. That's why the, we call it the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But we can have doubts and we can question. That's part of humanity. But let me encourage you. If you feel that you've totally lost your faith and you feel no connection to God, my, my question is, did you ever have a connection with God? That's the big question. Just because a person does something for the Lord doesn't mean they know Christ as Savior. The Bible is very clear about it. Remember, it says at the great white throne of judgment, people are going to come up to Jesus and say, I preached in your name, I did this in your name, I did all these things in your name. And Jesus said, but I never knew you. 
And I used to wonder on that verse a lot. I used to wonder, is that true? I mean, come on. People, they go to church. They give their tithes. They say they're Christians. Shouldn't we trust them? Yes. But, you know, there are some who look at this in a very different way from how you should. Their faith isn't there, really. It's a false faith. But in this case, with Joshua, he was told to be strong and courageous. We are, we're told also to be strong and courageous. Verse 7. Once again, God tells uh, Joshua, above all, be strong and courageous. Once again, that's the second time. Don't falter. Be careful of, to, to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn to it from the right or from the left. What God, what God here is saying is, is that you're not to add to the things of the Bible. You're not to take away to, from the things of the Bible. Just because you feel you have, a, you have an understanding that you can say this and this and this and this about the Bible, but really not be biblical, and you think that's right, you can get into problems. The Jewish people did this. As time progressed from this day and age of Joshua, we started to see a change in how Jewish people and the Judaism behave to the word of God. After the Babylonian captivity, they started what was called the oral, oral Torah, the spoken Torah, the mindset of the scribes and the priests, they thought, well, we know good enough. We know the word of God. We can make it better. And they started to add to the laws of the Bible. Now, there were 613 laws already in God's word under the Mosaic law. 613 laws are enough to learn. And I can guarantee you they weren't being kept. We know that because over and over again in the prophets, the minor prophets, God says, you're not keeping the law. And then the Jewish priests wanted to add more. Later on, after the time of Christ, they actually wrote this down in a book called the Mishnah. It's a very thick book. And these priests argue over what the Bible says in it. That's not the word of God. Then from that, they made a multi-volume set called the Talmud. And in today's world, most Jewish people who are following their faith know a little bit about the first five books of the Bible. They may read a couple of the other passages at different holidays of the year, but they do not know God's word in the Old Testament. And they don't even hold to the New Testament. That's new to, to them. That's the new, new covenant. They hold to the old one, but they don't hold to it. They hold to the Talmud, all of their writings. And you know what's very common in the mindset of even today? We will hold to tradition with tenacity. But do we hold to the Bible with the same tenacity? And there are times when traditions, even though they could be good, they take our eyes off the true reason for being a Christian. We take our eyes sometimes off of God and put it on good things. We have to be careful. And Joshua was warned also in that day and age where it's so easy when you're a leader of a country and you're going through stress and you want to alleviate the stress and you just think the world's around me, I just need a break. We all need breaks, I understand that. But we can't add to what scripture says and we can't take away from it. Scripture is not a place where you have a menu and you pick, I like this and this and this, I don't like that. No, it's the whole scripture. Even if you may not like what is being said, we need to understand as much as we can together all. It's important not to just skip on this one and be strong in this one. That's not the way you study God's word. And for Joshua, it was the law of Moses in the Mosaic books. For us, it's the whole Bible. So we need to remember that. But be strong and courageous. Verse 8. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For, for then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. So think about this. The word of God, I know uh, here at the church, in the bulletins, we, we, we've now started a new Bible reading. And I encourage you to try to read your Bible every year. That's a good thing. But let's go beyond just the reading of the Bible. You know, it's one thing to pick up your Bible. Maybe you're not doing anything. You say, oh, I'll do a devotion right now. 
you, you read through a couple of verses and say, oh, that's neat. And you say, thank you, God, and that's your devotion. Now, I'm not trying to mock that. It's better than not doing anything. But let me encourage you. The Bible is just not something to refer to if you have a problem in your life. And that happens a lot. We have an issue. We pray, oh, God, protect me from this. Protect me from, from, from what's going to happen. We might even read the Bible. I've heard people say, well, I close my eyes, and whatever the Bible opens to, that's my verse of the day. If you, do you do that when you get up in the morning? Do you just put your feet on the ground and say, whatever happens, it's my day? Or do you have a schedule to do? How many of you have an alarm clock? I have an alarm clock. Have you ever used your alarm clock? You know, they got a new alarm clock out that has big wheels on it. That when the alarm goes off, it pops down and it runs away from you. So you can't hit the sleep button. I hit the sleep button on my alarm clock. But think about this. Do you have a schedule that you have to keep? Do you have, do you have um, things you have to do because you are responsible? Well, just by flipping open the Bible and saying, that's the one, that's my verse for the day. What if it says... Something about death or destruction. Is that your verse for the day? No. What we need to do is we read it as a whole. And not just read it, but it says here, it says, this book of instruction must not depart out of your mouth. We need to speak it. Now, I am not one that believes that you say a word and that, and that is a something. I understand in the Hebrew language the word is the bear. To bear also means a matter or a thing. I understand that. I'm not ignorant to, to that. But a word has only so much power. Because I will tell you, it would be great sometimes to sit down in a chair and say, my word now is wealth. I'm waiting. Now, the meaning of a word can have great power. The words pertaining to the gospel message, have great power. Just to say, Jesus died for our sins, there's only so much power in that. But the meaning behind it, and the understanding on how to accept Christ as Savior, that's where the great power is. But to repeat the Bible, what it does, it keeps it fresh in our mind. To memorize it, one of the great commentators of many, many years ago, the 1800s, said, to meditate and ponder it throughout the day in your heart. How many times have we done that about the Bible? Pondering it in our heart. It's so important. This was being told to a leader of the nation of Israel. And then verse 9. Haven't I commanded you one more time? It says, be strong and courageous. And now in the Holman commentary it has a question mark of the Holman translation. Yours may not have a question mark. But God is the third time. Haven't I told you be strong and courageous? And then he continues. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. One of the great hopes that we are given in the word of God is that as a Christian we go through hardships, I know that. We've lost loved ones. We've gone through other hardships. It's, it's hard sometimes living in this world that's so far from God. But we're always promised this, if you know Christ is your personal savior, then he promises never to abandon you. And then he goes through the hardship with you. Sometimes he can take it away. I've heard various testimonies about maybe they had a spot on, um, on a lung or something and they went in and they looked and it was gone. Sometimes, miraculously, things are taken away from us by God. Sometimes they're not. And sometimes he goes through the hardship with us. But here's what the thing we can count on. If we depend on him fully, that he loves us, he will not abandon even in the hardest of times. So let me encourage you for this year. The word of God is very important. God himself is so important in our life. And fellow Christians, 
I'm not going to say just because of what's happened in recent time, but from the very beginning of the inception of the church, God has encouraged us to depend on him. And we must depend on him. I know sometimes it's easier when we're going through some hardships to really say, I understand that. Sometimes we forget when things are going great. But we need to remember whether it's the great time or the round mountaintop experiences or the valley, we're to depend on God and to keep him close. I'm going to leave you with this final thought. This was written many, many years ago. This was written by a gentleman who was a great Bible scholar of the early church fathers. His name is Origen. And in one of his homilies directed, uh, talked about Exodus. This is applied to Joshua also. And this is focused on the word of God. He says this, I fear, however, lest to, by too much negligence and dullness of heart, the divine volumes be not only veiled to us, but also sealed. So that if a book should be put into the hands of a man who cannot read, he would say, I cannot read. If it should be put into the hands of a man who can read, he should say, it is sealed. Whence it is shown that we must not only employ zeal to learn the sacred literature, but we must also pray to the Lord and entreat day and night that the Lamb of the tribe of Judah may come and himself taking the sealed book may deign to open it. This Bible that we all have, and I know many of us probably have multiple copies, this Bible is so important because this directs us to the God who gave it to us. And you might say, well, I believe in the inerrancy of the word of God. That's great. That's a start. But let me ask you, do you believe in the sufficiency? That is what's being debated today in Christian circles around the world by Christian leaders. It's not the inerrancy. It's the sufficiency. Is this enough? And I would dare say this is enough. And the focus on this pep talk to Joshua was that this is enough, God's word. Be strong and courageous and don't be discouraged. And that's for us today too. May we look at this coming year with a year of great opportunity. And may we always keep God's word close and dear in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for the opportunities you give us. Maybe there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Savior. Maybe they've never met you. Maybe they've heard about you, they've talked about you, they thought about you, but they don't have a relationship with you whether they're watching on the internet or whether they are here in person on the campus. My request is this, is that the Holy Spirit work on their hearts and that they make a choice to have that relationship with you. Maybe there's someone here without a church home. We'd love for you to be part of our church home. And maybe there's just someone there that just needs a prayer and needed this to encourage them to carry on to not give up, to not say, I'm done, but to say, I will go until the last breath I take to serve you, Lord. May that be the case. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. This time I'm going to ask Brother Jory if you'll come and lead us in that last hymn. We're just going to sing a couple verses. Just worthy of worship. God truly is worthy of worship. And he does care. And he loves us so. I'm going to ask us all to stand at this time.
chorus one more time without the instrument, but let me encourage you, sing it from your heart. Truly is God worthy. I believe he is. You are worthy, Father, Creator, you are worthy, Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Please be reminded this Wednesday, of course, we're starting our Awanas again. Also, too, um, for those of you who do participate in the Zoom meetings, your invitation has already been sent. But maybe there's someone here you're not doing it. I don't have your email. If you text it to me, I will be happy to put to send you an invitation that you can be part of this. This would be this evening at 6 o'clock. And t t tonight's subject is going to be the name of God, his personal name and, his, and the more generic name. So we're going to be discussing... How important is God's name? Well, with that said, let us bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, as we conclude our service today, may you just go with us to our homes. Allow us to always keep you first in our, in our lives and our first and foremost. And all, may we always represents you in the best